You are now listening to Bigfoot and Beyond, featuring the OG bad boys of Bigfoot, the Dr. Heckle and Mr. Jive of Squatchology, the Chip and Dale of Bigfoot, and I'm not talking about the cartoon. Please welcome your hosts, the Bigfoot celebrity couple, Biff Clobo, better known as Cliff Berrickman and James Bobo Fay. Hey, Bobo, how you doing today? All right, how's it going with you, Cliff? Things are pretty good, man. It's been an eventful week in general. I've got some uh, phone calls. I've got a sighting report on Monday. That was kind of cool. Somebody saw one on Highway 26, um, right up past Rhododendron at 5 o'clock in the morning on his way to work. So I went out and looked around a little bit, um, cast something. Not so sure it's a print. It might be erosion, but you know me. I cast everything and figured try to figure it out later, I guess. you know. But yeah, it's been a great week. Cool. Yeah, I mean, this is prime time. This is when the most reports of the year come in right now. Sure seems like it, doesn't it? October seems to be the month. It's definitely Rocktober when it comes to squatching. <laughs> right. Squatchtober. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Bobo, who do you have for us today? I'm, I, actually, I know, but I, I just want to be coy. Who do you have? I, I couldn't be more excited. We got the esteemed John E.L. Tenney. The famous uh, paranormal researcher, and a lot of people would say debunker. He's an author. He formerly ran for mayor of his city. He's a well-rounded guy. And so, welcome to John E.L. Tenney. John, welcome, welcome, welcome. So excited to have you on. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm excited to get weird with the two of you. (laughs) <laughs> That's the thing. You are by far one of the most unusual people I've ever met. And you're extraordinarily intelligent and well-spoken. I know a lot of weirdos and stuff, but I, like some people are just so weird in such a way that I don't want to hang out with them. But you're just not one of those people. You're delightfully uh, eccentric. And I just love that about you. And well-dressed. And well-dressed. Yeah. On top of all. He's probably got a three-piece suit on right now. That, you know, what's really funny is that started pretty much back in when I was in a punk rock band back in the days in the 80s. A friend of mine who had this super tall mohawk and a leather jacket, and I cut my hair in a mohawk and showed up with a leather jacket. He said, what are you doing? He's like, I thought you wanted to be yourself. You look like everyone else that's here. And the next show that I went to, I bought a three-piece suit and worked at the punk show, and everybody started calling me the weirdo in the three-piece suit. But I look different from everybody. Right. You still do. You stand out. Not everybody uh, who's interested in unusual things um, dresses to the T. Yeah, T-shirts and jeans pretty much seem to be the standard these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're up in the game for everybody. Yeah, there's another aspect to it, like, too, when I used to go into lectures and conferences back in the 80s and 90s, like, whether or not it's just a subconscious thing that happens with us, with authority figures, but... I always took the guys who were talking about, everybody was talking about insane, crazy stuff, but the guys that were wearing ties, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe he knows something more than I, he looks like an adult. That's a documented, uh, that's a documented phenomena, actually. I believe it. I mean, I really do think that it makes a difference when someone is kind of put together and even if they're telling you about UFOs and Bigfoot or ghosts, like your brain sees that as some kind of authority figure. Yeah, or a doctor's coat, white lab coat. Yeah, yeah. I would normally say a mask, but, you know, that's not the case nowadays. It's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to say, the last time I was talking to you, John, are you ready to admit now that you were wrong and I was right, that Bob Lazar is the real deal? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, still, I still don't believe Bob's story. Wait, who's Bob he, Lazar? Wait, th- 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 bring me into this. Who's this guy? The UFO guy from Area 51 that came public and Oh, yeah, that guy. Element 50, 115 and all that. He claims to have worked there and seen everything and all that other stuff. That guy, right? Yep. Uh, okay. So that's not the real deal, John, in your opinion? You know, Bob's story first came around in the late 80s, and by the 90s, people had their doubts because when you say that you've been to colleges and worked at places— there should be some kind, something, some kind of paper record trail of you being there. And by the mid nineties, no one could find any of it. And his story kind of got brushed under the carpet as made up. And then for whatever reason, his story came back around a couple of years ago and they made a documentary about him. And like you, there's still no evidence that he ever worked at the places he says he worked or even went to school at the places he went to school. 
I bet that feeds his narrative, though, doesn't it? Like he's kind of twisted it, and I'm not, maybe he did work there. Who knows? I don't know anything about this guy, but I know that at least in the Bigfoot world, like when you ask for evidence about a certain thing, particularly the the strange things, um, the person usually comes back. No, like I, there's they got rid of it, or the government brushed it under the rug, or that's what they want you to think, or no, they scrub the website, or there's some sort of a more even more fantastical paranoid thing behind it that feeds that person's narrative. Yeah, but with Bob, but with Bob though, I mean, they did. He's a bunch of stuff he said back then is now bored out to be true. Yeah, but I, I, I like. I think you know, if you look at science fiction writers, a lot of the stuff that they wrote bore out to be true too. Like if true. you if you guess enough and you say enough stuff and you talk for a long enough period of time, some of what you say is probably going to end up being true. Well, thank God. But he knew about the hand, the way the hand sensor worked, and element one fifteen, and. Um, his description of how they flew and all that kind of stuff. How, how does he guess that? But I mean, like, even the hand sensor thing, like, people have now discovered, like, there was an episode of Outer Limits that shows a hand sensor, and there was a, a science fiction movie out of England that showed in the United States that showed a hand sensor, like, back in the 60s and 70s. And so, right. I mean, you're just kind of thinking forward, and, and like I said, if you say enough stuff, the thing that really cracks me up, because you, you're right, Cliff, like a lot of people, especially in the UFO community, will say, well, my record's been scrubbed by the government. If I, Of course, they're not going to, they're going to erase my trail and my history. But the thing is, a lot of the times, the majority of the time in my life, I've found it's even people working against you make mistakes. They're just people. And something ends up slipping through the cracks. Like, uh, there should be a yearbook somewhere with his picture in it, you know, saying that he wanted to go to MIT. Like he said, he went to MIT. And the only evidence that anyone can find of that is like he intended like an extra course that anybody could join in, like a, like a four week course on physics at MIT that anybody can just join to. And that's not graduating from MIT. We found that paperwork, but then all of his doctoral paperwork just seems to have vanished. Well, you know, I think that we're getting ahead of ourselves um, a, a little bit. Let me, let's do this. There may be a couple people listening who don't know who you are, John. Um, like, like, for example, like I didn't know you were on a television show until years after I met you. Um, I just, you're just some cool guy I like to talk to, you know, that we see at these conferences and whatnot and, and et cetera. So bring us all, all the way back and tell us how you got so darn weird to begin with. He's not weird. I say that in a beloving way, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I, I talk about that at my lectures too. Like the first time I was called weird were by some kids that were probably punching me in a stomach, you know, and I really love words. So really quickly before I give you my brief history, like when I talk, when I call people weirdos and when I say people are weird, the etymology of the word weird comes from the 14th century for it's W Y R D was the original word. And it literally meant the people who lived on the outskirts of town that didn't follow the rules of the Kings and the Queens. It translates into those who manifest their own destiny. So when I call someone a weirdo, I'm saying like you think for yourself and and you don't necessarily follow the rules. So I, I that, does it have does it share a root word with the word wild by any chance? It does actually. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. That's very interesting. Okay. You know, speaking of the weirdos, that band. You remember the weirdos of the band? Yeah. They had a great squat setting down in um, San Mateo County below San Francisco, coming up Highway One. They had a gig at Santa Cruz at the, at the Catalyst the night before, and then they had a Friday morning morning radio uh, zoo cruise show or some kind of thing like that. They had to appear and play live at like 9.30 a.m. up in San Francisco, so they left at the butt crack of dawn, Santa Cruz driving north on the Highway 1, and a big female Bigfoot walked out into the Highway 1, held her hand out, like stop, like halt, like a cop would or a traffic you know, a crossing guard, then waved in, then three, uh, from like teenage size to, to uh, like kindergarten size, three little hairy squatches came out single file and trotted across the road and they walked off into the tree line. <laughs> yeah. Well, my goodness. Well, I, I, you know, I'm going to continue herding these cats around a little bit. So um, weird uh, means somebody, somebody who's living on the fringes of society then is essentially what you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm not one of those people that, you know, there's a lot of people in paranormal cryptozoology that have stories about when they were little and something strange happened to them. I'm not one of those kids. I legitimately was just a nerdy kid growing up in the, 
kind of lower middle class suburbs of Detroit. And I didn't like people telling me what I could and couldn't think about. I think that's part of why I joined a punk rock band and stuff. I just didn't want people telling me what I could think about. And I ended up making friends with people who were witches and psychics and UFO researchers and conspiracy theorists. And by, and by the time I was 18, I was giving lectures on things like political assassinations of the 1960s or 70s and UFOs. And, and you know, Michigan has a long history of, of strange cryptids, so that fascinated me too. And when I was in my second year of college, I thought I was just going to be a history teacher with a major in folklore. A friend of mine called me and asked me if I wanted to research for the show Unsolved Mysteries. So I quit college and that was my first foray in television and kind of never really looked back. I mean, I held a lot of normal everyday jobs, but I was always supplementing it by driving around the country, going to libraries and talking to people about weird stuff or working on television shows in the 90s like sightings or very scary stories on Fox. And when paranormal shows popped up in the mid 2000s, like all of a sudden, here's me still relatively young with, you know, 12 to 15 years of research under my belt. So I got tapped by a lot of those shows to find them cases and work with them. Yeah, a lot of the cutting edge paranormal or Bigfoot or what, you know, put the word, whatever word you want to put there, research is frankly nowadays um, done by production crews. Um, I mean, Lauren Coleman's kind of put that out there in the world and he's kind of put that thesis there that it's no longer benefactors and whatnot, you know, from, you know, Tom Slick sort of folks in the 1950s. Nowadays, it's production companies, which is good and bad. I mean, it, it's good because there's a lot of money there, of course, to be thrown around and these people are under the gun and they get some stuff done. And also, they're so gutsy and have no scruples because and they'll just call whoever they don't care um, and just get to the bottom of things. But and it's also bad because it's television and the vast majority of things on TV end up being nonsense or, you know, sensationalized at least. Um, so, yeah, you were one of those guys back in the day with those early paranormal sh- sightings, huh? Like that, those, that was the Henry Winkler show, wasn't it? Yeah, there was. he did a few episodes. I think uh, they eventually switched away from him and just kind of did a voice over host because, mm-hmm. you know, just for money purposes. But yeah, there's a, I'm sure if people dig through somewhere on eBay, a lot of those old, uh, weird UFO, Bigfoot and ghost VHS tapes that no one wants anymore. If you watch to the very end credits, you'll probably see my name in there somewhere as a researcher. <laughs> Cliff, tell the story about the, uh, FLIR, FLIR video, the Bigfoot from the helicopter. Oh yeah, that what, what, what show was that first? Um, uh, Unsolved Mysteries. Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah, Fleer contacted Finding Bigfoot at one time, um, saying they were clearing out some closets and all, they found a VHS tape that all, all it had was the word Bigfoot on it. And so they put it in, and they're uh, for all you know, it seemed to be a Sasquatch on Fleer walking, um, maybe like helicopter footage or something like that. It's like, well, what, what in the world is this? And they sent it to our producers and, um, they sent it to me or me and I'd never seen it before. I said, I don't know what that is. And they said, well, let's do an episode. Go, yeah. I mean, it looks good. Let's, let's do it and find out. It looks, so really find good. Out it looks really good. Right. And then, um, I have, we were filming in Maine at the time and, um, we, I, I was visiting with Lauren Coleman at, at his museum and I said, yeah, Lauren, we're going to be filming this thing in a couple weeks. And I showed him the footage and he looks at it and he goes, that looks familiar. And I go, really? Uh Oh, um, he goes, let me think about that. And then like later he, he sent me an email and, or called me or something. And he recognized the footage from one of those old nineties documentaries. Uh, the one where Peter Byrne was in it. And, um, they filmed over on the East side of mountain hood. And he was talking about how he has a helicopter at his beck and call at 24 seven and thermal imagers and all this stuff in like 94. And they got, they put some dude in a suit and um, they followed him around in a helicopter. I mean, that, that's what we were, that, that's the footage we were watching. But I had not seen that episode, so it didn't resonate anything with me. Um, and then I, I said, oh, my God, so we got to get ahead of this. We almost had an episode on it. Yeah. Um, so I called the producers and said, Put, stop everything. Check this out. Um, and they, they said, oh, my gosh. So I, I will forever owe Lauren for that. I think we all will forever owe Lauren for that one. It was a, talk about having egg on your face from the, some of the yeah. old research stuff. Oh, um, we were so we, excited. Oh, it was three. Yeah, we've. I think that was the one that eventually turned into the Oregon versus Washington one. Maybe I can't remember which one it was, but one of these ones that we filmed. So, anyway, yeah. So, uh, but to talk about that old research in the 1990s stuff, some interesting things have fallen through the cracks. Yeah. Oh, so, I would. I, I would. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked 
if there, I mean, there's, I know at least for unsolved mysteries, like you know, with the production of any show, right? Like there are literally sometimes hundreds of hours of stuff that never gets used and shown. And I, I have to believe in my little heart with some hope of hopes that there are still, you know, quarter inch and three quarter inch tape and videotape somewhere that has all of the interviews, like the extended interviews that we did with people, a lot of the B roll that we did. Cause a lot, like you said, a lot of that stuff doesn't make the cut just because it's not hyperbolic and, and, but it's still information. And I hope that, that doesn't get lost. It will. I hope the stuff that I set off, you know, didn't make the cut gets lost. <laughs> I'd be canceled. <laughs> I'd be in jail. <laughs> that well, that stuff for sure exists too. But I mean, that, you know, filming paranormal shows a lot of the time, something strange will happen if you're in an allegedly haunted location, and and for whatever reason, like the narrative just it doesn't fit along with you know being able to craft a story that fits in 44 minutes. And so that stuff just never sees the light of day. And that, that kind of bums me out sometimes. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, tell me about the, 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 um, or tell us, I guess about the, the, the show you hosted. I, I've never seen this show and I, I'm, I, I want to learn more about it. I definitely want to watch an episode. Not many it. people did. Yeah. Not many people did <laughs> <laughs> the show ghost stalkers. Yeah. Um, so it was just, it was, it was a paranormal show, but, I don't, you know, I have tend to working with networks and producers since the nineties, I tend to not work well with them. And I'm sometimes problematic with what I want and what I kind of demand if I'm going to be filming something. And so when I pitched this show to them where it's going to be me, someone who's done this for a long time and someone who's never done this before investigating haunted locations, and I'll go in for one whole night by myself. And then the next night, the other person will go in. And we can kind of show the difference between a seasoned investigator and someone who has no real frame of reference for it. Like they liked that idea, but like the first thing right off the bat was I told them, you know, I'm, if I'm going to be in there all night long, I don't want a camera crew. Like I, I want us to be shooting everything. And that kind of blew their minds. First of all, that I was going to be investigating actually all night long because a lot of the shows, ghost shows, you know, they might investigate till midnight or one or two o'clock in the morning, but they're really not shooting from nine o'clock at night until nine o'clock in the morning. Just union rules like your camera crew can't be there for 15 hours shooting a show. Um but I talked them into giving me camera oh, credits and, and Chad got camera credits and we actually went into places and investigated all night long. And once the network realized that Chad was going to scream a lot because he's in the dark and has never done this before, they really just edited the show around that and they thought it was really funny and engaging. And so a lot of the actual cool stuff that happens, I think kind of got glossed over. Plus, uh, we shot at a time where our first episode was up against a premiere, like a, a, a season premiere of The Walking Dead. And we just we just got buried. That happened to us, too. Yeah. <laughs> we had to go against uh, Sunday Night Football, which was the highest rated show in America, Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. Yeah, that happened to us. We got we our first episode got put against The Walking Dead. T -t Nobody watched it, so they moved us. They moved our time, and when they moved our time, they moved us to Sunday Night Football, and we got buried again. Then our third episode, they moved our time slot again. So I mean, we're three episodes in. We've already been on it three different times during the week, and that was enough to just sink the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, and you're trying to keep it real. Yeah, yeah. And there were some, again, there was some great stuff on that show that just, we were the first paranormal show. That was in 2014 or 2015. Uh, there were paranormal researchers, the Psychical Research Society out of England in like the 1800s. And they studied ghosts, you know, they, they're still around, but they were kind of the first ghost hunters and ghost stalkers. My show in 2014, 2015, like we were the first show to ever talk about them and show them on camera and like... I thought that that was just a, a huge thing. Like there's research missing from paranormal shows. And so I wanted to kind of solve that with ghost stalkers. And we did to a certain extent, but also, you know, if someone asked me, we went to a location where someone had seen what they said was a goat man. 
and they asked me about that. And so I gave this kind of long dissertation on the history of goat men. And if it, it was, was a short goat, dissertation, <laughs> it got cut down to one line because I was I said, you know, in this like 15 minute diatribe about goat men at some point I said, and you know, uh, Goat men are sometimes also recognized as demonic entities. And that was, they, they cut everything but that sentence. And uh, like when I saw the, when I was doing voiceovers and so I saw what was going to be the final cut, I just like, well, this is what it's going to be, I guess. What is, what is your thing on goat men? I think with animal people, I think that there is something, I think there's something psychologically like deeply embedded in us from at one time evolving from small mammals, from being mice uh, or the equivalent of something small and warm blooded millions of years ago, that there are these kind of archetypal imageries set into our psychology where when it's dark, when it's unknown, when we're in a situation that we're unfamiliar with, these kind of ancient evolved archetypes in our mind can pop up and we start seeing the things that we feared when we were tiny warm blooded creatures on the ground. I think that accounts for a lot of fear from UFOs and alien abductions. I mean, if you think about the fact that, you know, mice are snatched off the ground by these silent, uh, giant eyed owls with white faces coming out of the darkness and just pulling them into, you know, pulling these mice into nothingness. And then you look at alien grays with these giant eyes and white faces coming out of the darkness and abducting people in silence. Like, I think there's something there to that. Do you think that would be the source of the dog man phenomenon that we're watching unfold now? Yeah. I mean, it's possible. Also, I think that especially now with quarantine and pandemic, like people are really exploring the outside and seeing things like with new eyes. The thing that's difficult with me with dog man or Bigfoot and like the mix of the two of them is if you're in Wisconsin and you're near Bray Road and you have it in your head that you're going to see a dog man, but you see Sasquatch, like how do you rectify that? If you see a big, tall, hairy thing walking through the woods and your mind is set on dog man, you're going to say you saw a dog man, but you might have seen Sasquatch. Well, that, you're, a lot of people that see him, though, that, like, that's not the case. Like they didn't even they never even thought of dog man. They never they, they didn't think it was possible. And then they'd say, I saw a Bigfoot, and you'd get the description. It'd be like, huge dog snout, you know, pointed ears on top with a tail. You know, like, it's like, that's, those Bigfoots don't look like that. So, anyways, Bigfoot's, you're not saying Bigfoot's not real, are you? No, no, no. I'm saying that I think that when, when people when – when people see things that they don't commonly see, if they have Bigfoot in their mind and, oh, they, right, see, right. and they see a dog man, they say they see Bigfoot. If they saw Bigfoot and see a dog man, like the, the, the two can get wrapped up in their mind because what they're, they've never seen a large, upright, hairy creature walking through the forest. And so whatever's in their brain at the time, which is most likely Sasquatch because it's just the most popular, they're going to say they saw Sasquatch. But like you said, after you get their description and stuff, you can be like, oh, that's not a Sasquatch. That's something else. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Let's talk about Dogman a little bit more. I mean, I'm completely satisfied that say like Sasquatches are living, breathing hominins of, or hominoids, at least, as, of some sort or another. They're really here. They're, to me, completely biological. I've seen no reason to think otherwise. Dogman, I don't know what to think because the, the precedent really isn't there, to my knowledge. Um, there's not historical newspaper archives and stuff that detail sightings of these things, um, to my knowledge, at least to the extent of Sasquatches. Um, I don't, I've never seen a Dogman footprint, for example. Um, but yet, I know some good witnesses. So there's something up like what, what is your uh, idea or what is your hypothesis about that sort of thing? Yeah, I, with Dogman, I really don't know because so a couple of years ago, I, I have went and researched the Dogman case up in northern Michigan and a, a farmer had come out his back door of his house and looked across his field and thought he saw a man standing far off, maybe an acre and a half away from him. Uh, saw a man standing against a barbed wire fence, like legs kind of crossed, arm on the barbed wire fence, kind of leaning back, chilling. And as he walked toward it, he said that he saw what looked like a coyote, a very large coyote standing on its hind legs with its arm propped on the barbed wire fence. And when he got closer to it, it dropped down onto all fours, flipped itself backwards over the fence and took off into the woods. And 
when I went out there, I, I went out there a few days later, there were no tracks or nothing by that time. He had pretty much destroyed all of that by running around the area himself. But it was just this strange case of it, not even acting like a wild animal, like acting human. And that really fascinated me. So I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I did a, there was a dog man conference actually that I was a part of in defiance, Ohio. Um, and defiance, Ohio has a dog man, but it's more werewolf than it is dog man. You know, it was seen wearing uh, a shirt and pant, like ripped up pants, very werewolf esque that attacked people on the railroad tracks in defiance. So I don't know if there's something else happening with Dogman that is perhaps more psychological and less physical. And how, would, how do you think this would tie into the Jungian theory about UFOs being like physical manifestations of something psychological? Yeah, I mean, I when I get into the weirder occultish metaphysical parts of it and start thinking about Culpas and aggregors and thought forms and can you manifest something into the reality? Like that's where a, a lot of the stranger creatures I think might be coming from, like these kind of deep seated archetypes and, and embedded fears that we have psychologically. Or perhaps we're seeing something that we just have no frame of reference for. And so our brain has to categorize it as something. If you see a creature with a long snout, we're most commonly familiar with dogs looking like that. And so our brain says that's a dog man, but who the hell knows what it really is. Or it could be, we could be familiar with it through the whole demonic aspect. If that's the case. Yeah, for sure. And again, like, you know, it's one of those things you were saying, you know, that Bigfoot, has like this kind of real generated history that we have tracks and we have prints, but the idea of where people is far older than Bigfoot, the idea of a large upright hominid. Like we have stories about werewolves and where beasts of all different variant sorts that are, that are coming from somewhere that are historically talked about throughout folklore and mythology for centuries. Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't think we're going to crack that nut today. <laughs> but I'll tell you, my favorite Michigan case uh, is from the 60s, and I'm sure you guys know about it, but it's I always call it the Atomic Bigfoot, which is the Monroe Monster, which was Christine Van Acker and her mom, and allegedly a Bigfoot tried to pull her out of a car and gave her a black eye, and it's oh, yeah. right over by the, by the Fermi Power Plant in Michigan. Whatever happened with that one? Like, the cops came and... There was police reports, right? Oh, yeah. So the cops came. There was a like two week long search that 1500 people like combed the forest looking for something. And uh, then a, a Sasquatch type creature got spotted in Three Rivers, Michigan, which is a few hundred miles away on the other side of the state of Michigan. And so then the search started over in Three Rivers to look for that thing. And a couple weeks later, the police basically just made a statement in the paper saying uh, it was a man in a woman's fur coat. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, easy to write things off like that. But she was injured, wasn't she? Yeah, her face was scraped up. She had a black eye. And that same night, about two hours after her alleged attack, there were some women coming back from uh, – uh, our card like they had a, a woman's card game night and they were coming back in their car and something jumped in front of their car and actually slammed its hands on the hood of their car and dented the hood of their car that same night and the police said you know this was just a, this guy trying to fool people and scare people sounds like a really dangerous way to do that yeah and probably jumping out in front of driving cars in the middle of the night smashing their hoods is probably not the smartest, greatest <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> That's how I meet women. <laughs> That's why have a girlfriend for 12 years. Yeah. yeah. What's interesting to me about that case, though, is as far as I know, and I've tried a couple times, but I just end up getting lost or getting involved in another case because it leads somewhere else, is that uh, Christine Van Acker, that, that woman who was attacked, is still alive. She still lives in Michigan. And there still has to be, I mean, she was relatively young. I think she was 17 at the time in the yeah. 60s. And uh, I'm sure a lot of the, the people who searched the woods at that time are still around. But, you know, as the days go by, the people 
you know, pass away and, and information gets lost. And I, I'm really surprised no one has tracked her down and, and put her on record. It's not easy to dig into some of those older older cases, uh, and I mean because the people are dying. And what well, I'm finding now, I'm dealing I'm dealing with this whole Bosberg thing right now, the Bosberg Washington stuff that dealt with those uh, the, the so called cripple foot casts. Although I don't, I don't think it's kind of an inappropriate name nowadays, but like the Bosberg incidents. And I'm trying to find uh, witnesses who had seen them. I spoke to one gentleman who actually saw the prints in the ground. Um, his 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 brother has so far eluded me, and um, I, I've been working with the Colville uh, Historical Society to try to dig some of these people up. Up. Not literally, because some of them actually are dead, but like <laughs> just to try to find them. Um, and uh, and I've gotten some uh, stuff, like, but like no contact. But, but most recent thing I heard was, yeah, Cliff, a lot of those people are dead. But that sentence implies that they're not all dead. So um, can help me out, you know. Um, so I'm still trying to find people like that too. Um, it, it, and I, I do think that these historical cases are worthy of looking into because even even already, um, in my cursory glance glance at the Bosberg thing for the last couple months, found new, I, we found new casts that, did, that nobody knew existed, um, you know, from, from almost 50 or 50 years ago, I mean, pretty much. So it's, these old cases, I think, are very worthwhile looking into because as the, the young whippersnappers in the community that we once were, and, you know, now we're the old men of whatever field it is, but um, we're looking at this thinking, oh, well, the horsemen already looked into that. I mean, Green was there. Krantz was there. De Hinden was at the Bosberg thing. I mean, Patterson was there. Uh, Dennis Jensen was there. Certainly, they would have done as thorough a job as could possibly be done by humans. Apparently not. Um, I, I think that old cases like that need a second glance, no matter how many decades have passed. So uh, I hope you hope, hope you either chase this person down or um, know somebody who does. So. Yeah, it's it's one of those things, right? Like I was trying to put together a television show about the UFO sightings in Michigan in 1966, which are arguably like the largest UFO sighting. That's the one that became known as the swamp gas sighting. Yeah. But you have, you know, hundreds of people seeing these UFOs over the course of two weeks. The police officers are chasing them in their cars. And I was like, this needs to be documented. And so I went to a network and pitched a whole show about, like, we have to find these people because now they are passing away. It's getting less and less every single day. Let's get them on record finally. And, and maybe we can come to some type of not answer, but at least some kind of resolution about how they should feel about their experience. And the network was super into it. And we started shooting and going around with the network. Uh, there was a telephone call. And at some point they said, well, is there any way that we could slip some like Bigfoot type monsters into the show? And I was like, no, it has nothing to do with that. And they were like, well, we just think it would be more interesting if there was a monster. And <laughs> I told them like, I didn't want to do the show. And we, they, that, that's how I don't get along well with networks. Like I just told them, okay, I'm done. I'm not doing the show. And then we didn't do the show. And I'm kind of sad in it because we were getting people on tape who, were really instrumental and, and really involved in the 66 sighting. But yeah, I, I like a, that Christine Van Acker case, like everybody makes documentaries about almost anything strange now, which is to make content. And I'm so surprised there's not an hour long documentary or a Netflix documentary. This is a Bigfoot attack, right? Like this is a not very common experience of the, an enraged Bigfoot, you know, uh, physically attacking someone and attacking another car and 1,500 people searching the field. Like, you'd think that'd make a pretty good two-hour doc. And where did you hear about this case, John? Oh, I think I first read about that case in probably one of Lauren's books. Um, I know that it got covered here extensively in the newspaper. That was, you know, a Michigan case, so it was pretty easy for me to go to the Detroit Public Library and just pull all the microfiche records and start Xeroxing everything. And uh, But I think I probably first read about it in one of Lauren's books. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty well known, Cliff, that one. Well, you know how I am about names, man. I can, names are like water in my hands. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, since it's close to the Fermi power plant, like I said, not to uh, some things are hyperbolic, but in my notes and in my files, I always write the atomic Bigfoot just because it was right there. And it sounds so 1960s. It sounds like a good sci-fi movie. Yeah, because you know, John, you're a noted uh, skeptic and you're a debunker. Do you ever get hired to do that for these shows? Because I, I mean, you've, you, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you told me some great cases that you unraveled. Yeah. Uh, so every now and then 
people will call me in, not so much to debunk an entire case, but ask me, you know, one of the things I did when I really realized I was going to be a researcher and investigator, the, one of the first things I did was like join the International Brotherhood of Magicians and the Society for American Magicians because I wanted to know how my brain could be tricked just by magic. And then I started studying hypnosis and going back through all the old books that people use to fake uh, seances and, and spiritualism. So a lot of times with ghost hunting shows, they would call me in and say, you know, this is happening. This is happening. Can we figure out if there's a an actual rational explanation for this where it might not be a haunting or someone might be trying to trick us? And, you know, it, that's good because you don't get fooled on television. You know, the show doesn't come out and then someone says, Oh, I, I tricked you and fooled you. But people have done some really, I mean, I've seen people do stuff as crazy as putting, uh, swallowing dry ice chips so that their stomach will gurgle to sound like a demonic, like voice in the dark. Whoa. Huh. No kidding. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's crazy the lengths people will go to, to kind of hoax and, 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 you know, try and fool television shows because they want to be on TV. You know, because um, I remember when we were at one of those paranormal conferences and I was impressed because I wasn't impressed with a lot of like a lot of those people like palm readers and psychics and this and that. I was like, these people are, they're fooling themselves and fooling other people. But the one person, the one person that I thought this person's the real deal was Amy from uh, Dead Files, I think her show is. And you said, yeah, Amy Allen. Yeah, yeah, Amy. And I, I go. She. I go. I just knew she was the real. You said. You know what? Out of the thousand people I've interviewed, you said she's one of four that I've you believe. Yeah, I mean, I've run into so many. I used to in the early two thousands. I used to go around, go around Michigan and test psychics. So, like I had this huge thing that I would do, and people would tell me they were psychic, and I'd have them come in and do all, all types of experiments. And I don't know, I must have tested hundreds of, of psychics in Michigan. And out of the hundreds I tested, there were maybe two or three that that could do something that was really interesting. And sometimes it was, you know, there was one guy that everybody told me was the best psychic. And I was really doubting what they meant by best psychic. And I brought him in and tested him. And the first thing that I would do a lot of the times, if I was not really impressed with meeting the person and maybe not thinking that they were psychic right off the bat, just kind of using my BS detector. The first thing I do is I just have them do a red and black guess on a 52 deck of cards. And he did his 52 reading and he looked at me and, and kind of giggled when we were done because he had gotten 50 of them wrong and he had two of them right. And he said, well, what do you think of my psychic powers? And I said, I think that you're probably one of the best psychics that I've ever seen because getting 50 wrong is as insane as getting 50 right. <laughs> yeah, at a 50% chance with each card. It makes, yeah, that's astronomical. Um, the odds against that are, are, are phenomenal. Yeah. And so, like, the idea, it was so funny, just – he was a psychic, and after I continue, I tested him for about a week and a half, and what seemed so bizarrely incredible to me was that he was a psychic who always got everything wrong, and it was this whole twist on psychic powers, like he just couldn't get it right. There was something in his brain that he did the opposite of what he was supposed to be doing, uh, whether it was card guessing tests or doing remote viewing, it was always exactly the opposite. It was so strange. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a um, you know Church of the Subgenius J.R.R. Bob Dobbs thing, uh, where Bob Dobbs bungles his way through divinity. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, the, the 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 art of the of the divine accident, I guess you know. Yeah. And, and being a magician too, you know, it did help because a lot of psychics and a lot of mediums are just doing magic tricks. They're just doing cold readings. Uh, you know, that they, they know the estimates. If you're talking to a, a, a man who seems to be between the ages of, you know, 18 and 30, there are a lot of things that you can say to a man, 18 and 30, no matter who he is, if he was brought in, usually, you, you know, you find their name, you can Pretty much you guess that they're in the location that you're in speaking, and you can generalize to the point of seeming like you're psychic. With Amy, for instance, what, what convinced you she was telling the truth? One of the things that I find with people who seem to actually have some type of psychic power is that they 
I, I don't like to use this word, but I will just for lack of better terminology, which we, we don't have in a lot of the paranormal supernatural world, but they seem to almost really be cursed with it. Yeah. And the way that they, their body, their eyes, their mind, their voice, like everything reacts while they're doing it. It's almost as if there's some kind of miswire that's happening. And I see that a lot when, when I watch Amy do what she does and just the way that her throat will click. Uh, there's little subtle things that happen with her eyes. Some of them are not so subtle. And I, if she's faking, I mean, it's the one of the best I've ever seen. So she's almost like uncomfortable in a, in a way. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. One of the one of the people that I know who lives in Michigan that I think is a, a really valid psychic, a friend of mine named uh, Damien. He um, he does not promote himself as a psychic. He doesn't do really psychic readings. I asked him to do psychic readings. I told him like I want you to get out of your wheelhouse and I'm going to do a lecture and I want you to come in the back and do psychic readings for people and don't charge them. I'll pay you whatever you want. I'll pay you you know fifty bucks a reading or something like that and. I did my lecture and at the end of my lecture, he came up and he was like, you don't owe me anything. He's like, I did half of one reading and I just got really bummed out by it. And I thought to myself, like just that aspect of like, if you were in this to make money, <laughs> like he could have sat back there and made a few hundred dollars during the lecture. And he looked so worn out and so tired after doing a quote unquote psychic reading for someone for 10 minutes and then just refused to do any more for the rest of the night. Like that's, that is really telling about a person. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. You know, a few years ago, um, I heard you speak. I wasn't in the same room, but you were actually over the loudspeakers at the time, which I really appreciated because, you know, I was at my vending table and I don't get a chance to see the other speakers, but I actually heard yours. Um, and it was the first time I'd, I'd heard your, uh, many, any of your, uh, your, your lectures. And um, what, what I took away from it that I thought was really cool that you'd, you don't get a lot of um, was I could hear in your voice and and. I could hear your encouragement for the audience to dive in deep and enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy the weird that that you find yourself in, um, and and how phenomenal that is to be able to do that. And you're so encouraging to the audience in this sort of way because, frankly, I berate the audience. I say we're not doing enough not good enough job. You call yourself a researcher, you know, like that. And like the old man crotchety Cliff is on stage, and everybody feels bummed when I leave, right? Because I'm trying to up everybody's game. But you, but um, you, you're much more encouraging than I am, and I just think that is so gratifying to hear. Um, so, it's, can you tell us a little bit about that? about just that sort of spirit from which you come? Yeah, I mean, I have always been the type of person, first of all, I know that people have difficulty talking about their Bigfoot encounter or they saw a UFO or they think they saw a ghost. Like the, the, the weirdness that people experience, a lot of people have difficulty with voicing. And I really do believe that if there was if we all talked about the weird stuff we did, the weird psychic flashes that we have, premonitory dreams, seeing a weird light in the sky, if we, if we discussed that openly and honestly with each other, we would realize that it's not so weird. Like we live in a vastly strange universe that we know actually very little about. And not only that, but the joy that comes along with mystery and the hunt, like going out into the woods in the darkness, uh, going into an allegedly haunted house, staring at the sky, looking for UFOs. These are things that the majority of people don't readily do. And so when you're doing it, you should be able to think to yourself, like, how much fun is this? I'm, I'm in the woods looking for Bigfoot or uh, I'm in this old prison and I'm looking for ghosts. Most people who have lived and who will live don't do what we do. They don't think about what we think about. And that is joyful to me. Yeah, it really is. And it's nice to hear a voice like that because being so deep into it, like I am, and I know Bobo is and all that, you know, but being 
being in our positions, I think is something that is easily for myself, at least forgotten, um, that I, I do somehow, you know, live an extraordinary life, even though it seems like my ordinary life is the one I wake up in every day. Um, but it is extraordinary. And I, I forget that sometimes because all my friends are weirdos too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But it's, it's one of those things, right? Like, to look for a UFO doesn't mean that you have to have like flares and night vision cameras and stuff. It just means you go outside and like stare at the night sky and, and look at space. And, and while you're doing that, there's something in you that starts to contemplate the, the weirdness of reality and, and what's going on. And when you're sitting alone in an allegedly haunted house, you start to think about, you know, your, mortality and the seemingly shared reality you have what's going to happen with you when you die you get very philosophical sitting out in the woods listening to nature and seeing this vast crazy world of color and sound that the animals experience probably in a very different way and and how you relate to it because we're animals as well and i I do just really think it's wondrous yeah, it, it absolutely is. Now, now the, the the experience you just described is essentially the the description of um, of a fan or an aficionado or someone who's interested in the phenomenon, whatever it is, UFOs, Bigfoot, etc. So, where is the line, in your opinion, where someone crosses over from being um, an enthusiast and into a researcher? Is there a line, and, and if so, where is it? I think for me, the line was the first time I cold called a witness. I think that really made a, a, a deep difference in just being someone who was fascinated with the phenomena to actually like standing on a stranger's front porch. And I am about to ask this question of a stranger. I'm about to get into this conversation with this person who had what they thought or might have had an experience. And I think doing that, talking to experiencers and people who have had experiences and tracking down old cases that you can go and talk to those people. I think that's kind of where the line gets crossed. Hmm. So in a way it's kind of, um, probing someone else's life uninvited and documenting it. Yeah, that part of it. And I think there's also a part of it too, where I think that you leave being a fan behind once you start doubting what you're thinking about. Well, that's an important thing. Um, tell us, talk, talk to us a little bit more about doubting what you're thinking about. I like this line of thought. <laughs> it's, it's one of those ideas. I mean, now, especially with social media and just the way the Internet is, you know, we get in these spheres uh, that reconfirm everything we already believe and think that we believe. And it's hard to get out of those bubbles. And when you start to realize like, oh, maybe that is not how it is. You know, I always tell people, and, and it's one another reason that I sometimes get razzed in the different communities, whether it's UFOs or cryptos or ghosts. I tell people all the time, like, I truly try not to believe in anything. Like a belief is a concrete shoe. It keeps you from moving. I have an infinitude of ideas. Ideas are malleable and flexible and they can change over time. And and that's something I'm very receptive to, especially when I'm talking to someone about something like Sasquatch or talking to someone about UFOs. Like if, if a person thinks that UFOs are only nuts and bolts and that's it, it's just a, a high tech civilization that figured out how to do this before we did and they came here. That doesn't seem all that interesting to me if that's all the phenomena is. But if that's what you believe it is. I think it's very limiting in the scope of realizing how weird the world is. And so I think challenging your own belief and saying, am I right? Am I wrong? Is that idea better? Being able to throw out your old ideas as your ideas evolve, I, I think is vastly, vastly important. How much should um, the, uh, your own modification of your own paradigms be based on evidence versus um, say gut feelings or something like that hunches. I think it's different for different scenarios. When it comes to something like if you're looking for a flesh and blood Bigfoot, there is evidence, which I think physical evidence that will change your ideas about that physical creature. When it comes to something like ghosts, that change has less to do with evidence because I think that ghostly experiences and supernatural experiences like that 
are individualized and they're kind of meant to help us on our path to development of our understanding of the world. Uh, with UFOs, it gets into a really weird area where there is physical evidence and also a very deep psychological part. So I think it plays, I, I think it plays different roles in the different phenomena. Well, because you had your own, uh, like you died and all that back in the day. I remember you saying. Yeah, when I was 18, I had a heart attack and, and died. And total time of death was three and a half minutes. And when I recovered from that, that's really when I started my journey. Before that, I was doing a lot of lectures on government conspiracies. And I, I think I said that earlier. And when, when I recovered from that, I was like, oh, what happened to me, not only biologically, but psychologically? Like, what, what did that experience mean? And what does it mean when humans have that experience? And, and how does that change us? Do you remember any of it? Or is it just a missing three and a half minutes? No. So with my death experience, there are, so typically with death experiences, there are three major experiences that people have. The, the first one is the tunnel of light and loved ones and going toward the light. And it's very happy and positive. And, and that's the one you hear about the most because it's a positive experience. And, and that's how people understand it as a positive experience. The second one is usually the person is out of their body. They're watching the doctors work on them. They're aware of being dead. They're in the hospital room or in the ambulance watching everything going on, seeing people cry. That is kind of the second most common experience. And then the third experience is, which is the one I had, is called a null or a void experience, which is you go from living in this seemingly shared reality with everybody else to and existing solely by yourself inside of infinity forever. And there's nothing there but you. You are nothing but thought or, you, you know, you can call it consciousness, but you are only aware of your personality existing in the void forever. And that was my experience. It's kind of difficult to talk about because it encompasses eternity and infinitude, which don't have really great words. So the idea that I was in a place forever seems strange to be saying to you now, because this is obviously after forever and forever isn't supposed to have an end. It's supposed to go on forever. So the words kind of fall apart at a certain point. I think you uh, got a preview of your trip to hell coming up. <laughs> so the thing that's really interesting when I talk to other people who have had similar experiences is that in the moment, it seems very hellish, very purgatory. Um, but the reality is that when you recover, when you internalize it properly, when you really start to think about it, it is a very transformative experience in the sense that I, when I returned back to this reality, I was much more caring and much more loving and much more appreciative of colors and sights and sounds and simple things and animals and people. And so it was a net positive experience. I would have to think that dying would make you appreciate living, certainly. I tell people all the time, and one of the things that I remember, like, uh, when I woke up in the hospital bed, there was this whiteboard across from me and it was framed in kind of dark oak wood. And I remember looking at the wood frame and thinking to myself, wow, brown is such a beautiful color. And I almost never saw it again. You realize that brown gray, like these things that we take so much you know, advantage of, we don't even think about them anymore, how, how spectacular and beautiful they are. And then when you start to think about people and individuality and, and each person that you meet, how uniquely special they are, it, it really, like I said, is transformative. Does that affect you when you're doing investigations into like ghosts and that sort of paranormal stuff? Yeah, to a certain degree. Uh, I usually come at the when I'm investigating for a ghost or a spirit or something like that, I really truly try to not personify uh, that entity or spirit, whatever people want to call it, uh, in the sense that everybody thinks that a ghost is kind of just like an invisible version of you that can walk through walls and stuff like that. And I really think that, you know, the six-year-old me 
doesn't exist anymore, but John is still here. I, I have changed and grown because of the experiences of my life. And so if I were to die and be out of my body and still exist in some form, I would be having all new experiences. So how long would I remain John? How long would I remain this version of John? And a lot of people talk to ghosts like they're people. And I talk, I try to, to speak to entities or research entities or research cases as if knowing that they were people at one time, but that they have become something that's unknowable to me at this moment. Is that your uh, model for what ghosts are? Things that were once alive and no, are no longer? Some of them. Uh, I think that I have as many, I think that there are probably as many different types of spirits and entities as there are ideas about uh, spirits and entities. You know, whether you start to think about, you know, if, if, if there are extraterrestrials, do they have ghosts too? If, you know, so, and why wouldn't they come to this planet as ghosts? And so maybe some of the extraterrestrials are ghosts. And, you know, when I was at, uh, I was at dinner with Amy Bruni, this was a couple of years ago, and her daughter, I think, was four or five at the time. And her daughter said, you know, why are there no dinosaur ghosts? And I thought to myself, like, well, maybe there are. Maybe that's why you can't catch Ogopogo and you can't catch the Loch Ness Monster and, and you, you can't catch the dinosaurs that people have spotted. Like, maybe we're seeing the ghosts of prehistoric creatures. Maybe some of the Bigfoot sightings people see are cavemen ghosts. I will say one um, researcher suggested that these orbs are Bigfoot ghosts, um, which, of course, you know, I, I, I don't even want to think about it at this point because I'm worried about the physical animal, let alone with this other stuff, you know. Um, but th that's certainly been brought up before in the context of Sasquatches, that something like that is going on. And I guess why not? But I'll, I guess I'll, I'll worry about that. You know, maybe when I'm dead, I'll look for Bigfoot ghosts. Um, in the meantime, I will look for living ones. <laughs> well, that's the thing too. Like I tell people at my lectures all the time, like research the thing that you're interested in. You don't have to look for Bigfoot as an, an alien or Bigfoot as a ghost. If you're interested in Bigfoot as a upright hominid, you know, with local motion, like go, go for that and research that. If you want to, if you do want to, in, you know, investigate aliens simply as nuts and bolts saucers, go and do that. Like do what makes you happy and, do what brings joy into your life and fulfills that, you know, search for the mysterious that we're all kind of on a quest for. Yeah, it's one of the things I appreciate about my friend Tom Powell, who thinks that Sasquatches are, you know, paranormal in, in nature, etc. Um, and he goes, ah, Clef, you apers. He, he calls me an aper, even though I think that's not exactly appropriate. It's not appropriate to actually what I actually think is going on. But ah, you apers, I'm glad you're doing it. It means I don't have to. We just compare notes later. You know, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You, you do you, man. I'll do me. Yeah. And know that the other thing I stress too, is I try and tell people at my lectures, like know that you're like, it's not supposed to be a, we're not supposed to be trying to, you know, one up each other, like whatever weird paranormal, supernatural, cryptozoological experience that you've had personally, that each person has had personally, that experience is enough uh, a lot of the times we have people saying like, well, I saw a Bigfoot one time and someone will jump on them and say like, well, I've seen 12 Bigfoot in my life. And like seeing Bigfoot one time is a big deal. And that experience is enough. Like you don't have to keep upping your game because that sometimes will lead people to hoaxing stuff, which then messes up everything. Yeah. Yeah. How often do you find hoaxers versus real, sincere people who experience something strange? Would you venture uh, like a percentage or something like that, or um, or even common? Often, you know, that's sort of how often are you feeling people are either lying to others or perhaps lying to themselves? I feel like a lot of the times, I don't think there's a percentage to hit, but I do feel that when I encounter a hoaxer or someone who is fabricating evidence it really does have a lot to do with repeater effect where they will have one genuine or real experience and you know then being unsatisfied with that they per they start making stuff up to stay current to stay in the kind of loop and conversation but and, and then that, that eventually will discount their original experience. You know, if you discover that they are hoaxing stuff, then even the real genuine one at the beginning uh, falls into question. But I don't it's not that often. I, I think that people are mostly genuine with their experiences. 
Uh, I just think that there's also that part of humanity where if they don't get the fame or, you know, recognition that they think they might deserve from having a weird experience. That's, that's where people can start really messing up and start hoaxing and, and even I think fooling themselves about what they might be experiencing. What's the, what's the craziest thing you saw that blew your mind like paranormal wise? Um, that's a fairly, so if I go ghost, uh, then probably in 1999, a friend of mine who worked for the, well, this is not ghosts, but kind of spiritual, uh, in 1999, a friend of mine who worked for the archdiocese of Detroit, they asked me if I wanted to sit in on a, a Vatican sponsored, sponsored exorcism. And so I did that. So I spent, you know, 32 hours in this room with the client and two priests and watched them perform an exorcism. And that really warped my brain for a few years, trying to rationalize it and understand what I had seen and what the experience could have and might might have been. Uh, that was that was really crazy uh, in a spiritual sense. And so maybe kind of in a ghosty sense or uh, it not. Was it successful? It was successful. It was uh, very, very strange. I mean, it's not at all like you see in the movies. The client slept most of the time, but the client did do things like speak multiple languages that there's no way they probably could have known. Um, they would manifest uh, weird, what looked like bruises and scrapes on their on their skin that would disappear within moments. Uh, the body would contort in various ways that I would think would break bone and, and, you know, pop muscles out of joint and didn't, uh, it was, it was very strange. And then when it was over, you know, the client went to sleep and the, the, the priest said, that's it. And it was done. And How many client, priests? Uh, one priest and one assisting priest. And then where did the spirit the go? Do they, they put it into something or they just let it go in this? Ether. No, so I just actually had a conversation with a friend of mine about this recently, which was, you know, some of the things that don't get talked about or, or have become popular because of movies that are, you know, based around exorcisms and stuff. But when when a, a Catholic priest is doing an exorcism, they don't really expel the entity and send it back to hell or get it out of the body or whatever. What they're doing is they're actually doing like a dissolution of evil. So it's just dissolving out of the person so it doesn't really go anywhere it just ceases to be huh, okay and then you know i've seen some pretty crazy ufos uh, up in northern michigan there were some uh really fast moving non-traditional lights in the sky that seemed to be uh what people would say are unidentified flying objects and there's a structure to one like actual craft or just lights no, I saw in 1993, I was actually working a midnight shift at a job and I went outside and saw um, a black triangle that was illuminated from underneath. It had almost like orange bubbles beneath it mm -hmm. and it was flying silently over the city. Um, and at one point, it was so strange because when I first looked at it, I thought it was someone was flying a kite. It was like three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. I thought, who's flying a kite at three or four o'clock in the morning? And then as it got a little further in front of me, I, I thought, oh, that's a weird flock of birds. And then right before it disappeared over the top of the buildings to my to my right, I thought to myself, oh, that's that's a that's a that's a UFO. And then it was gone. And it was so strange that I was looking at this thing for a minute and a half. And UFO was the last thing that I thought about when I saw it. It probably should be, though, to be fair, you know, kind of eliminate everything else. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, when uh, we were at uh, Michigan Paracon together a few weeks ago or a month ago, whenever that was, I have a pretty elastic sense of time. It's hard to tell sometimes. Um, you told this wonderful story about manifesting a sea monster of sorts. Um, and I think it's so, uh, I don't know, I've been asking if you would mind telling that story because number one, I think it shows that, um, you know, group thought is a pretty cool thing and it's kind of interesting and the possibilities what may or may not come from it, especially when we're staring down, you know, the, the barrel of a strange gun pointed at our world today that's all screwed up and everything. Um, but also um, how uh, when you do manifest the thing of your wishes, um, it may not be the form that you expect. Um, like I always say that we know like when you make a wish because you see it 
a shooting star and a wishbone and a turkey or something. I always wish for something I already have because that way I know the wish is going to come true and it just seems to be efficient that way. Um, but I, I, whenever I've asked for something else, I, I always seem to get it. You know, if I pray for something or if I sure want something and I, I meditate upon it um, in some sort of way, I always get it, but it's never the form I want. And I think your story kind of uh, shows a nice example of that in a very humorous, awesome, lovely way. Yeah. So um, I did a cruise with, I, I didn't know if I had told her, Dana had told it. Uh, we went on a cruise. Uh, Amy Bruni puts together these paranormal cruises and she asked me if I could do something like, can you, can you do something for the guests after the speakers, you know, after we have dinner? And I said, yeah, I'll put together like a group intention, a group experiment. And so, uh, we did this twice. We did it on two different cruises, the, but the first time I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I talked to some friends back in Detroit who are occultists. And I said, you know, this is the idea that I have. Let's, let's try and manifest a giant sea monster, some kind of Lovecraftian elder beast to come out of the ocean and, and we'll see what happens. And so I got all these people out on the deck of the ship and, I've got them all kind of chanting and they've got their hands over the water and it's late at night. It oh, must've uh, been a sight to see. Holy it smokes. Was so much fun. And the horizon that we were facing started to not be very viewable. And it looked as if there was a black cloud rolling in. And as soon as that happened and people noticed it, you know, everybody's eyes were open. As soon as we all noticed it, like people stopped chanting, they moved, removed their hands. They started to get scared. Um, cause it seemed like we were actually generating something that we were, something weird was about to happen. And I was telling people like, no, 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 let's keep going. Let's keep doing this. Let's keep doing this. Uh, but people got nervous and started laughing and, and some people got scared and walked away from the deck. And, and this thing that was coming toward us off the water, this, this black kind of, shapeless cloud coming toward us just kind of dissipated and, and and disappeared and people were like oh that's really weird and i wish i could you know i was telling people i wish we could have held on to it longer and uh the next morning i wake up to the sound of foghorns and our ship over the course of the night had gotten lost in the ocean and there was a fog bank that had surrounded our ship and you, they weren't allowing anybody out on the decks because you, you literally couldn't see off the side of the boat. The, the fog was so thick and we were, I think 60 or 70 miles off course. And you know, those giant cruise ships are all run by computer. Like they're not supposed to go off course. And I really still kind of think to this day, like we, we manifested something like something happened to our boat and people on the ship were very scared. Uh, but we eventually got back on course the thing that's really crazy is so that was we were that was a trip to Bermuda. And when we had done that, we were actually just on the tip of the Bermuda Triangle, too. So that was one of the things that I kind of wanted to do. And when we got back to shore a couple of days later, the day that we got back to shore, uh, a boat actually came. They found a boat had risen from the bottom of the Bermuda Triangle while we were while we were on our cruise. <laughs> no way. I yeah. love it. Yeah. John, where can people follow you on social media or your webpage? You got a book? I know you got a book you can let us know about. Yeah, I try to make it easy for everybody. So it's just uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff is just my name. One word, John E.L. Tenney. Uh, and then any book that you can find is probably on Amazon. Uh, I suggest if people, if any of that is too hard for people, they go to Google and they type my last name, T-E-N-N-E-Y, into Google and then type the word weirdo after it and then just follow wherever it leads. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Now, aren't you doing a podcast right now, too? Do you want to push that? Do you want to plug that? Yeah, I do a podcast. It has nothing to do really with paranormal phenomena unless it comes up. Uh, but I do it with my friend Jessica. It's called What's Up Weirdo. And uh, I normally talk to her every single day. And so I decided during quarantine, I wasn't getting my fix of hearing weird bar conversation by going out and seeing people. So I told her like, let's just record our phone calls and we'll put one a week out and people can just listen to two friends talking to each other. And maybe they can find some camaraderie in that. So it's called what's up weirdo. And that website is what's up weirdo.com and it's available on all podcast platforms. Oh, that's strange. It's kind of how this podcast was born actually. So <laughs> 
I was already yeah. talking to Bobo anyway. So, <laughs> John, thank you so much for coming on Bigfoot and Beyond. I, I when whenever you're not near, I miss you. <laughs> I only get to see you once or twice a year, but man, what a pleasure to have you on! Thank you so much, John, for setting aside some time for Bobo and I. Oh yeah, I'm going to try and put an event together for you and Bobo to come to Michigan. Oh, I would love that. Love that. Yeah. Cause you know, when we're all, we're on the Bigfoot circuit and you're on some other circuit and, um, and it's rare that our paths cross, but it is always a joy when it does. Yeah. I need you guys to come up and look at the swamp on my family's property that I just found out might have a squatch on it. Oh, I would really? love to. Yeah. Love to. Mr. Tenney, we appreciate you putting on your three piece suit and getting on the air with us, even though it's audio only. You yeah. Bobo and I are usually you. naked. So I'm not today. It's too cold, but Anyways, yeah, man, we appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you again. You're an awesome dude and a great guest. Thank you. No, thanks for having me, guys. It's honestly like a pleasure talking to fun weirdos and, and getting the chance to reconnect with you guys. So thank you so much for doing this and, and even having the show. I love this show and just hearing you guys banter about strange stuff. Now that I know the definition of weirdo, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not offended at all. <laughs> you finally came around, Bobes. <laughs> You're a different kind of weirdo, Bobes. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, folks, so that was another episode of Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo and our guest, John E.L. Tenney. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you next week. And until then, keep it squatchy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 